Hello, I'm Dr. Goldman, and this lecture is intended to give a brief introduction to the biophysics of blood flow and circulation. I'm currently an associate professor in medical biophysics at Western University in London, Ontario, Canada. Now, references for this lecture, if you want to do more reading, would be a book by White and, Wait and Fine called Applied Biofluid Mechanics, um, 2017 and the book by Mayor Zamir called Human Dynamics um, from 2016. And Mayor actually is an applied math professor at Western University. He's emeritus now, um, but he's done a lot of research in human dynamics and I, I recommend his book. Uh, so the objectives of these lectures um, overall is to begin understanding cardiovascular biology by applying uh, physical principles. So that's the overall objective. Um, some of the things in particular that we wanna get across in the this lecture is the biomechanical properties of blood, arteries, and veins. Um, understanding pressure, flow, and shear stress, those fluid concepts, and also understanding Poiseuille's law. Um, we use Poiseuille's law to explain something called Murray's law, or sometimes it's called the cube law. Um, and we'll also talk about basic properties of pulsatile flow in arteries, um, and this will be for rigid vessels, but the results are a bit more general than that. Um, so these are the basic topics we'll be covering um, and we'll mostly be considering uh, blood flow in arteries. Okay, so first we'll talk a bit about blood. Blood is about 8% of body weight uh, in humans. Um, healthy adults, there's about five to six liters of blood in males, about four to five liters in females. This is just based on, on size. Um, the density of blood is a little bit over one gram per milliliter. Uh, the color of blood depends on its oxygenation. Um, when blood is well oxygenated, it's scarlet red, and when it's deoxygenated, it gets darker, a more dark red. Um, so blood components. So plasma is the uh, greatest component of blood by volume. It's about 55%. It's a yellowish straw-colored liquid, and it's 90% water. Um, red blood cells are about 45% of blood volume. They're also called uh, hematocrit, I mean, sorry, er erythrocytes, um, or I call them RBCs. And hematocrit is the volume fraction of the blood, it's, it's red cells. So that's about 45% normally. Um, red cells carry oxygen by binding to hemoglobin. Um, in terms of flow, plasma, and red cells are the most important components of blood. Blood also contains white blood cells or leukocytes, which are involved in the immune response, they're immune cells, and platelets, which are involved in clotting, okay? But those two components, white cells and platelets, don't affect normal blood flow very much, okay? Blood has a viscosity, which is about three or four times the viscosity of water. Um, viscosity increases with hematocrit in blood, so the more red cells, the higher the viscosity of blood. Um, blood becomes less viscous at high shear rates, so basically if it flows faster, there's higher shear stress, and that decreases the viscosity of blood. Um, this shear thing property has to do with the fact that red cells are flexible and they can deform as shear gets higher and that tends to lower the viscosity. And red cells can form rouleaus or stacks at low shear rates and that tends to increase the viscosity. Um, so that's why blood is, um, has a viscosity that's shear dependent because of the red cells. Um, often in, in modeling and things, blood is assumed to be a Newtonian liquid, which means that it has a constant viscosity. This assumption is generally valid for arteries and veins under normal conditions. Okay, so we can normally assume blood is an Newtonian fluid. Um, so to pump the blood through the vessels, we have the heart, and the heart has the structure of two pumps that are side by side. Each side has a, uh, an atrium where blood comes in and then a ventricle where blood is ejected. So the left heart takes oxygen-rich blood from the lungs and it sends it out to the arteries and to the body. Okay, so that's what the left ventricle does. It ejects flow into the aorta, which flows out to the body. The right heart takes oxygen poor blood from the veins and it pumps uh, the blood out to the lungs to get oxygenated. So those are the two sides of the heart. One goes to the body, one goes to the lungs. Um, each side of the heart has valves to prevent backflow. There's a valve between the atrium and the ventricle on each side, and there's a valve between the heart and the outflow vessel on each side. So there's four valves in the heart. Okay, um, cardiac output, or CO, 
is usually considered as heart rate times stroke volume. So heart rate is uh, like a frequency. So for example, 70 beats per minute is typical. Stroke volume, about 70 milliliters per beat is, is typical. And so if you multiply those two, you get a cardiac output of about five liters per minute. So that's a typical uh, blood flow from the heart. During exercise, cardiac output can increase by a factor of about seven at, at, at maximum. And this is due to increases in both the heart rate and the stroke volume. So they both increase in exercise to increase cardiac output. Uh, blood vessels. So for different sizes of blood vessels, they decrease um, in size, but increase in number towards the capillaries. So the arterial side of the circulation coming out of the uh, left ventricle in the heart is basically a tree um, with vessels increasing in number and decreasing in size. And the smallest vessels are the capillaries. Um, the total cross-sectional area of uh, blood vessels increases as you go down the arterial tree and it gets the largest in the capillaries. So this is cross-sectional area or surface area. And so this large area is important because it allows exchange of oxygen between the blood and capillaries and the surrounding tissue. Um, after the capillaries, then the circulation starts to um, form larger and larger vessels on the venous side, eventually going back to the heart in the vena cava. Um, now most of the blood volume is actually in the veins because they have, they're larger in, in um, diameter than the corresponding arteries. And they also are compliant so they can change their volume a lot. So there's a lot of reserve volume on the venous side where, where blood um, sits. Okay. So blood vessel structure, so just a little bit about this um, and some terminology. So the lumen of a blood vessel is the blood channel where, where blood flows. The intima is the inner layer of the vessel wall, and this is covered by endothelial cells. And they're not inert, but they can respond to shear stress and they can release various substances. Um, and then beyond the endothelial cells, there's a layer called the media, which is mostly smooth muscle cells, which can control vessel diameter by contracting and relaxing. Um, and then larger vessels have elastin fibers and sheets to give compliance for oscillating flow so that there's elasticity in the vessel wall. Um, beyond the media, there's a layer called the adventitia, and that has collagen fibers to protect the vessel and to anchor it in place. So that's the outer, outermost layer of the vessel. Um, now, this is a general structure of all arteries and veins, but arteries are under higher pressure than veins, and so they have thicker media and more elastic structure um, to support the uh, high pressure that comes out of the heart. Um, so a little bit now about fluid mechanics, about pressure, flow, resistance. Here's a little diagram of a, a vessel or a tube with the pressure P1 coming in, P2 going out, a flow Q, which is like the volume flow, and then a resistance R. So this delta P, which is P2 minus P1, is the pressure difference along a segment of a vessel. And so that causes flow because since blood is a viscous fluid, fluid only flows when there's a pressure difference. And so pressure has units of force uh, per area. Q is the flow rate. This is volume of blood flowing per unit time. So those are the units, so volume per unit time. And then the resistance R, um, that is, has various units depending on you know, the units of, of Q and delta P, but uh, sort of a physiological unit is a peripheral resistance unit, a PRU, and that is a millimeter of mercury per milliliter per minute, where a millimeter of mercury is a unit of pressure. Um, so those are your resistance units. And if we want to relate pressure flow and resistance, then the flow is the pressure drop delta P over the resistance R. So this is similar to Ohm's law. Um, we all know V equals IR. If you turn that around, the current I is a voltage drop over the resistance. So that's similar to saying, the flow of blood Q is the pressure drop delta P locally over the resistance. Okay. Um, so blood pressure, if we talk about physiologically, blood, blood pressure is usually given by two numbers. So systolic pressure is when the heart pumps and diastolic is when the, when the heart's relaxed. So the typical blood pressure is 120 over 80 in, in millimeters of mercury. And venous pressure is usually around 10 millimeters of mercury or less. And for, for simple modeling, it can be a 